Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you this morning as we worship together with Westview. As we get ready to worship together, we'd like to let you know about a few important things that are happening at Westview. The first one is Alpha Online. Alpha starts this Sunday on June 14th from 7 till 8.30 for 12 weeks. And this is an opportunity for you to explore life, faith, and Jesus together with others. If you haven't signed up yet, contact Anne in the email below. We still have life groups online available and you can connect through Zoom groups, but we also have opportunities to connect over phone. If you haven't connected yet, we would love for you to join and contact me, Tina, at westviewbaptist.ca. You're also reminded that on Sundays, we do take time at 11 o'clock to get together. We'd love to reconnect with you in our virtual gym. Uh, grab your own coffee or snack and join us online. The link is provided in an email that's sent out or message us on YouTube or Facebook and someone will get back to you as soon as we're able. This morning, our call to worship is found in Psalm chapter 46, verses 1 through 3 and verse 7. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear, even if earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the water surges. The Lord Almighty is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Let us worship together.
Hi everyone, I'm outside in my garden again today and I am transplanting my plants. My plants are starting to get really big and they're ready to go in the ground. Now before I bring my plants outside, I need to do something called hardening. And this is a term that's used to help describe getting them ready to go outside. So when I grew my plants inside, everything was pretty consistent. The temperature was always the same, the amount of light was always the same, and it's not windy inside a house. So what I needed to do was to take my plants outside for a few hours the first day and a few more hours the next day and kept bringing them outside until they could handle being outside all day and all night. And now my plants are ready to go in the ground. Getting these plants ready to go in the ground is a lot like preparing each of you to grow up, to be healthy and strong, and to be able to handle difficult moments in your lives. There might be small things that are hard to handle, uh, and they might seem a little bit big right now, but maybe you're a little disappointed that you can't go to a birthday party, or that school's been canceled and you can't go back and see your friends. Or maybe there was this time when someone said something really mean to you. The good news is that we can get through these moments or that we will get through these moments and God will be with us through them. When we get through these tough times, we grow and we're able to handle bigger and more difficult moments. In James chapter 1 verse 2 he says, Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Now, I wouldn't imagine having a difficult moment would produce joy. Usually I'm kind of upset when bad things happen, but he looks at it in a different way. In verse 3, it says, For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Just like when I took these plants outside, they were tested a few hours and a few hours more every single day. And now they have a chance to be strong when I plant them in the ground. When we know that we can rely on God to help us through the smaller or shorter bad moments, we can have a strong belief that God will be there for us on the days that might be even more difficult. My gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy. Steadfast love, my deep and 
I am Beverly Barrett and happy to read the scripture for us this morning. It's from James 1, 1 to 18, New International Version. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings! Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The word of the Lord through James. Hey everyone and welcome in worship again. It's good that we have met together. Welcome whether you have been a long time part of Westview Baptist Church or whether you are joining us for the first time or you've just been joining us off and on while uh, we experience this online. We're glad that you're here. We are starting a new series today and we're looking at a book called James, which is a book in the New Testament of the Bible, the second half of the Bible. But before we dive into that, I want to ask you something. What are you like when you're sick or injured? Now, we can all react differently, and some of us get accused of being like little babies when we get sick. Um, some of us handle pain better than others. But what do you do? What are you like? When you are sick or when you are hurt, are you a grin and bear it kind of person? Don't tell anyone. 
Are you a wail loudly and get some attention kind of person? Or are you the kind of person who maybe puts on a bit of a stoic face, but deep down you want some sympathy and you're just waiting for it? Like I say, we all react in different ways, but how do you respond when things aren't good, when you are sick or whether you're injured? The reason I ask is that the book of James is written to a group of people who are in pain. Now, James, you need to know, first of all, who wrote this book was a half-brother of Jesus, our Savior. They grew up in the same family. Joseph and Mary raised them. Now, Mary was Jesus' mother and James's mother, but we know that Jesus was, was born miraculously. That is at the core of our Christian faith, whereas James has Joseph as his father. Jesus had at least four brothers, at least two sisters, but James was one of them. And James went on after Jesus' resurrection, after he had gone back to heaven, J James became the leader of the first church, the church in Jerusalem. And we believe that he wrote this letter early on in the history of the church. In fact, some people believe it is the first piece of literature, Christian literature, that we have. And we believe it was written just after a time of persecution, after a Christian named Stephen was uh, killed for his faith. At that time, the church in Jerusalem scattered because they were suddenly persecuted. And Christians fled to the other areas of the Eastern Mediterranean. James, as the leader of the church in Jerusalem, wanted to continue to shepherd and care for these, these uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who had scattered to all these different places. And so he writes this letter to them. Most of them at this time would have been Jewish people who had put their faith in Jesus. So they weren't from the Greek world or the Roman world or, or culture. They were Jewish. And that's reflected in, in this letter. But as we look at this letter, what we see is practical instructions for people who are struggling to live out their faith now that they're not all huddled together. I think maybe we can uh, connect with that to some level for those of us who have been Christians for a long time. Right now, it, it can feel like a struggle to maintain our faith when we're not gathering in the same way. We are scattered but we still want to be encouraged, we still want to be challenged in our faith. You know, these Christians were facing big challenges, and James knew that. He wanted to guide them in that. He also knew that they had to face these challenges. I don't know if you have this memory, but I have very strong memories as a child of trying on clothes and uh, now most often it was hand-me-downs, but every once in a while my mom would take me into a store because I needed to buy something that hadn't been handed down, and I would try it on, and she would look at it and she'd say, how does it feel? Does it fit? And I'd say, yep. But then she'd ask the clincher, and she'd say, does it feel like you've got room to grow? Now, that was always a bit of a disappointing question for me. If I found something I liked and it felt like it fit, what did I care whether it was big enough to grow into? But my mom didn't want to spend money on something that was only going to last a few weeks. And I think this is a reflection of the kind of faith that James is urging his congregation into and that we need to be urged into as well. A faith that's going to last more than a few weeks, a faith that is going to last when we hit rock bottom, when we have to go through long difficult times, when we're waiting on the Lord and we're not hearing back from him, when we are struggling to hang on, we need a faith that we can grow into. And so I would suggest to you that James is saying, you need a baggy faith. You need a faith that is big enough that you have room to grow into it because God wants us to have a growing faith. So if you have easy answers in the face of hardships, I might suggest to you that, that that's not faith speaking. That might actually be opinion speaking. Easy answers seldom 
uh, pass the test of time. Uh, they, they need to go through those trials to find out whether those are answers that are real. James is urging his congregation to stand the test of time. Do they have a baggy faith? Do you have a baggy faith? Are you ready to grow? Well, what does a baggy faith look like? I, I believe it's a faith that deals with things that are bigger than we are. You know, it would be easy for us to face a situation that's daunting and say, I can't handle that and set it aside or want somebody else to deal with it or just deal with it on the surface where down, deep down inside of us, we're still struggling with what it actually means. A baggy faith takes that struggle and looks it straight in the eye. Not because we have answers, we certainly don't have easy answers, but because we want our faith to be stretched. And it's stretched most when we face the, the challenges that are bigger than ourselves. So how do you handle hardships in your life? If your faith can't handle the hardships you're facing, I'll suggest to you that your faith isn't worth wearing. But James believed in a faith that was big enough, that was baggy enough. And this is what he presents to his congregation. You know, he starts off, he dives right into the hard questions. How do you deal with hardships? And basically his answer is, stop complaining about what God is doing to you and start thinking about what God is doing in you. You know, it, again, it's the natural tendency for us to want to blame God, point a finger at him and say, why are you doing this to me? Those are natural questions and God doesn't mind those questions. If that's where you are today, ask him. Just don't stop there. James pushes and prods his congregation and he says, listen, when you're facing these trials, there's something else, there's something deeper going on that you need to be a part of. And he goes on to say that the goal of all of this is maturity. You know, again, there it is, growing up. You know, when you're a kid, you can hardly wait to be grown up, an adult, mature. And you have visions of what that looks like. As Christians, or as people seeking faith, even if you have not put your faith in Jesus yet, we have an idea of what a spiritually mature life looks like. And we don't always have it right. James challenges us with the words that our faith and our hardships that we face with our faith develop characteristics that we need, like perseverance. Perseverance, carrying on day after day when the hardship doesn't let up. But not just carrying on in the hardship, carrying on looking to God. He pushes a little harder and he says, you know, if this is hard, ask for wisdom. And God is eager to give us wisdom. You know, maturity is, uh, it's kind of like a tree, a fruit tree that you plant and you want it to bear fruit that you can eat and enjoy. In fact, uh, James actually describes us like being the fruit from fruit trees. Uh, at the end of this passage, he, he says that we're, we're like a kind of first fruits. Uh, the first fruits that come off of a tree that you're so excited about. The best, the freshest, the ones you've been longing for. That's what maturity is about. You know, you plant that tree and you wait because you know it's going to take time. And what a disappointment it would be if you planted it, you watered it, you fertilized it, you pruned it, you cared for it, and season after season, it flowered and then nothing else. We actually have a tree in the front of our yard which is beautiful every spring, we love it. It's a cherry tree, but it's an ornamental cherry, which means it's beautiful, but there's never any fruit that we can enjoy. God wants our lives to be fruitful. And to be fruitful means that we have to go through that long process, that long season. It includes weathering the storms, the droughts. 
and continuing on so that fruit forms and fruit is harvested. Maturity is about the long haul. And that's why James talks about perseverance, about consistency. If the first bit of trouble that comes along knocks you to the ground, makes you give up your faith, then it probably wasn't faith to begin with. We need to stop complaining about what God is doing to us and think about what God is doing in us because God does not spare his people from hardships. He allows us to go through those hard times so that we, we come out stronger and more mature in the end. And part of that is that in the process, we reach out to God. That's why James said, if you need wisdom, if you lack wisdom, ask. God is delighted to give us his insights. Wisdom is so important. And I have to say, wisdom is not the same as knowledge. There is no A in wisdom. There is no A plus in wisdom. It's not about how smart you are or how smart other people think you are. Wisdom is about teachability. Are you able to learn? Now, you might say, well, that sounds like the same as intelligence, as being smart. Well, but wisdom means that you're willing to learn. And it doesn't matter if it takes you a day, a year, or a lifetime to learn one thing. If you are willing, then you are wise. I forget who it was you told me, but years ago, someone said to me, knowledge is reading a book once. Wisdom is reading a book twice, three times, four times, going over it again and again, not just to glean information, but to know it, to understand it, to ponder how it applies to me. Wisdom takes time. Wisdom requires a heart that is teachable. Now, you can know if you're teachable because when those challenging times come, are you blaming somebody? Are you looking for someone to point a finger at for why it's going wrong? Or are you asking the question, God, where are you in this? When we look for God in the midst of the hardships, then we have a heart that is willing to learn because it doesn't feel like God is with us in those times. Wisdom means teachability. And a teachable heart is willing to sit in those hard times and wait on God. But if you're not teachable, then you're looking for somebody else to blame. You're angry. You're bitter about what's going on. And, and James has more to say about that later in the book. What it looks like to be the wise person as opposed to the fool. The fool who's just absorbed in themselves. What's really interesting about this passage is that after talking about maturity and perseverance and hardship and the wisdom that we need to get through it, James, it seems like, just all of a sudden does a complete turnaround, switches topics, and goes into something else. But he doesn't. He starts talking about money. And it does. It, it feels jarring. You know, he talks about uh, those who are poor being proud of their high position and those who are rich being proud of their humiliation. And, and everything that he's saying is almost complete nonsense to us because we live in a world that values money so much. Now, this relates because in the ancient world, people assumed that if you had money, if you were wealthy, then you were blessed. And if you were poor, if you were going through hard times and difficulties, then obviously you'd done something wrong. And the gods or God was punishing you. James doesn't allow that. Here are people who are scattered. They're far away from friends. They're far away from their pastor and from the other teachers that they were used to. And it was easy for them in the midst of the hard times to think, what have we done wrong? They lived in a culture that would have asked that same question. What have you done wrong to deserve this? And yet that's not how Jesus looked at things. As far as Jesus was concerned, money was a tool. 
or money was a hindrance. I don't, some of you will remember the story of the interaction that Jesus had with a young man who was very wealthy. Uh, you can find this in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 23. This young man who was eager to be obedient to God, who was eager to follow Jesus, comes running up to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to be a part of the kingdom of God? What do I need to do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, well, obey the commands. And he says, well, I've done that. And then Jesus says, there's one more thing you need to do. Sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and then come and follow me. And that young man bowed his head and turned around and walked away. You see, Jesus was looking at his life and where he hadn't said this to anybody else, he only said it to this man, he saw that money had become an obstacle for him. It had become more important to him than God. He had bought into the idea that this is the ultimate life. This is what we aspire to. But Jesus was saying, no, you need to aspire to something greater than money. You need to aspire to the kingdom of God. James would say you need to aspire to maturity in our faith. Jesus was urging this young man to change his worldview and to flip it upside down. To see that money had become a hindrance to him. Where Jesus wanted him to use it as a tool to bless others. Money is not a reward. Money is not a sign of God's blessing. Riches and the life of ease aren't a sign that you've got it all figured out. In fact, it's the opposite. And right after that interaction with that young man, Jesus said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because the rich carry with them something that has the potential to be a wall between them and God. Money has the potential to convince us that we don't need God. We've got it all. We, we have all the resources we need. Why would James throw this out there? Well, because for people in pain, looking at other people who have it easy as far as they can see, it's easy to start aspiring to that instead of the kingdom of God. It's easy to start thinking that the hardships are a punishment from God instead of realizing that there is something that's good here. James turns it all on its head and he says, you who are poor, you should be proud of your high position. Why? Because you are in a place to understand what it really means to trust. But you rich people, watch out. Because you are carrying a load that has the potential to cut you off from God. He turns it around because even in the church, in the world, it's easy for us to assume the same priorities, to think that we aspire toward that life of ease, to assume that that's the sign of God's blessing when it isn't. And in all of this, James keeps reminding the people how good God is. God is good even in your suffering because he is ready to provide you the wisdom that you need. He is there to grow you and mature you. He may not explain exactly why, but you can trust that he's good. He has walked with you into this situation and he will walk with you through it. And what's amazing is that these words are being spoken by a man whose brother he calls Lord. I've got two brothers, and I know what it's like to grow up with that sibling rivalry, with the competitiveness, and brothers don't naturally treat each other like this. James knew and believed that his half-brother Jesus was someone extra special. He had experienced the goodness of God by watching Jesus teach and heal, challenge and confront, by watching Jesus go to the cross and lay down his life, and watching him come back from the grave 
proving that he was more than a half-brother. In the second chapter of his letter, James even calls him our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. James recognized him for who he was, not a biological family member, but the God of the universe who is so good that he would come to us and step into our painful world and experience that pain himself. And so if you and I want to know how to face the hardships of life, we need to look to Jesus. James says that God is the source of every good and perfect gift. And the best gift of all is that Lord, that glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. He came from God. He is God. And he leads us to himself. If you want to face the hardships of life with grace, then you need to know the source of grace. And that is the God who laid down his life for you and me. If you want to understand what value there is in the pain and the suffering that you're going through right now, I can't give you that answer. But he can. He may not give you the answer you want to hear. He may not tell you in an audible voice. He may not even tell you right away. But as you lean into him, as you continue to trust that the circumstances of your life aren't what determine the value of your faith, then you can believe that there's a reason to carry on. I keep saying at the end of my messages that life in Jesus Christ is worth it, and it is, not because it takes away the pain, but because it shows us the God who knows pain and who takes those painful circumstances and turns them into something that grows us so that we begin to fill that baggy faith. So how baggy is your faith? Maybe the first question you really need to ask is, how am I, who am I when it hurts, when things aren't going the way I want? How do I react? Am I complaining? Am I blaming? Am I pointing a finger? Or can I step back from that and look to God and say, I don't like this, I don't get this, but I believe that you are good and I believe that you can bring something good out of this. And God, who is rich in mercy, will come to you in all of his wisdom, in all of his grace, and walk with you through those painful times. We get to experience the person of God in the midst of our pain. So stay tuned, stay safe, and stay the course, because life in Jesus Christ truly is worth it.
now let me dismiss you with a blessing. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.